Welcome to the How HR Leaders Change the World podcast. I'm your host, Cecilia Crossley, and each week we explore how the work of HR leaders is also creating positive social change, contributing to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, goals which the world's companies are increasingly understanding the urgency of achieving and investing in the action required. If you'd like clear, actionable ideas for how you can use the power of your role to affect change in your company, you're in the right place. Following a corporate upbringing, I founded The Social Enterprise from Babies With Love. We provide services to HR leaders, and through this work, I realized that HR professionals and social entrepreneurs are working in the same areas, albeit in different ways. So we created this podcast to share knowledge on steps we can take through the work of HR. In my opinion, if you're an HR professional, you are also a change maker. And this podcast will provide you with examples of how, by sharing the successes of some of the world's most inspiring HR leaders, you can frame your work in the context of positive change, implement brilliant ideas, and feel absolutely wonderful about doing so. Welcome to Hugo Baguet, an esteemed HR leader with a with a long career that he will introduce himself in a moment, but most formally as the global member of the board for HR at Rio Tinto. A very big welcome, Hugo, to how HR leaders change the world. And please may I ask you to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely, Cecilia. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all. Uh, first of all, I have to say that I'm uh, since 2017 no longer with Rio Tinto, uh, but I worked in different industries with indeed 10 years at Rio Tinto between 2007 and 2017. Before that, I was with Hewlett Packard and I worked also in other industries in telco, in pharmaceutical, and I started my HR career actually in banking. Uh, many, many decades uh, ago now. So uh, th- that's a little bit about me. And I mean, what I'm currently doing, I'm also serving as the chairman of the COM committee and as a board member of Jones Lang LaSalle. So that's, that's a little bit about me. Yeah, and another sector to, you know, to add in as well to that wealth of experience, which um, means I know it's going to be fascinating to hear your thoughts on the five questions that we ask our HR leaders. So I will um, lead us into our first, which is, as an HR leader whose influence creates social change, what do you feel has been your most impactful action to date? I mean, reflecting on, the, on that question, I would, I would like to give a double answer. So I'm twisting a little bit from the most impactful to the two most impactful. Uh, One is actually, and this will resonate with a lot of HR leaders, I believe, uh, how we dealt with the Ebola crisis, a health crisis in Africa uh, in 2014, 2015. Uh, We had at that moment in time at Rio Tinto uh, 4,000 employees, I mean, really in the danger zone, in the heart of the Ebola zone. Uh, And actually with all of the actions taken, also with, I mean, the great leadership that we had on site, I mean, fortunately, not uh, one single employee got contracted with Ebola, nor did their direct families. And throughout the crisis that lasted 18 months, we were able to support all of those families and, and keeping actually uh, the operations on a uh, on maintain and, uh, and care on a, and care program. And I think a lot of HR leaders will reflect on the COVID crisis as one of the proudest things that they've, I mean, helped to navigate an organization through, which is, 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 is not easy. I mean, over the, over more, to give a more sustainable answer to, to your question, I would say, I mean, Creating economies around mindsets uh, is quite important. So as an HR leader, you need, in mining in particular, you need to look broader than just the workforce uh, that you employ directly because mines come to a natural end. That can be after 15 years, it can be after 25 years, it can be longer. But what is important is what you leave behind are sustainable communities. And what you can do as an HR leader to create those local ecosystems where the ecosystem, the economics, 
the social uh, the dynamics will still work after the mine has closed is quite important. And this is for, I mean, what the challenge is for HR leaders in, in the mining industry, and I'm also sure in other industries, is to balance what you do in the short term I mean, to directly support the operations versus the long term and the social impact you have. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there, but I'm, I'm, I'm particularly proud also of the second one because uh, that is the legacy that you leave. Hugo, you say you'll stop there, but I actually have so many follow-up questions from those very two um, interesting examples that you gave. So if I may, firstly, on your experience in dealing with supporting your people in the centre of the Ebola crisis, and there are many HR professionals around the world that will have dealt with a pandemic before. I'm also thinking about HR leaders supporting their people with SARS um, when that was spreading in Asia and Ebola, of course, and many of the children that from Babies with Love supports are orphaned by Ebola or or affected by the many issues that that created in West Africa. Um, But many HR professionals might not have had to deal with a pandemic before. And, um, And given we're in a pandemic, I thought to ask you if there was any particular learning from your experience in dealing with Ebola that you've seen improved upon and being used in practice today in dealing with COVID-19 that you would recommend all HR people working on this huge challenge implement? Um, again, I would, I mean, I, I, w- I would give you a, a couple of things. One, the importance of empowerment. Um, it is really important that crises like the Ebola crisis that we dealt with uh, in Guinea, West Africa, I mean, where the local leaders could make decisions very quickly because they were on the ground. They were dealing with the crisis on a day-to-day basis. And we were sitting in the headquarters in London, and it's really hard to make decisions. Now, some decisions we've made, like we, we made the decisions to continue to pay the workforce during the crisis, 18 months, um, without coming to work and without having to remote uh, to work remotely, uh, so to speak. Uh, but I mean, the bulk of the decisions were enabled uh, enabled locally. That, that's important. The second thing I would say is work on on the basics. And I mean, it's about education of not only the workforce but also their families. So make sure that that communication with their broader environment is intact. And then the third learning would be, and I'm sure that will also resonate with many HR leaders, is think about uh, mental health. Um, I mean, a health crisis like this, uh, I mean, takes its toll, especially when it lasts for for many, many months like like COVID today. And we didn't foresee when Ebola broke out that it would last 18 months. I mean, we thought it was going to pass away in a couple of months because all of the previous Ebola crisis lasted maximum three months. So that was the base case scenario. And we were wrong and we had to change gears and really put the emphasis on, I mean, true engagement with the total workforce and making sure that we understood the mental health issues that are happening and 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 all of the stress-related issues that you're dealing with. Yeah, thank you so much for elaborating on that, Hugo. And I I would also love to ask you about what you said about the balance of short-term and long-term impacts for the communities where you work. And knowing, of course, that for many, I mean, mining companies, but not just mining companies, for for listed companies who have the uh, quarterly reporting pressures um, of the stock markets they're listed on, and the tension that therefore exists between short-term and long-term societal impacts. I was wondering if you feel in terms of trends and, you know, amongst the, your peers and all the senior professionals that you talk to, do you feel optimistic that the long-term view is embedded in decision-making and or being taken perhaps having an equal to priority or if not greater priority than short-term impact. Um, Do you feel any change happening in that that's enabling HR professionals to care more holistically for the broader societal impacts of of a company's work? I mean, definitely during my time at Rio Tinto, I saw that loud and clear. Uh, 
but that's also given the nature of the industry uh, because you make very long time investments, so to speak, where you need to take all of those uh, potential challenges on board on beforehand. So the industry is already more geared to that. But speaking more broadly, and I mean, uh, even today I talk with a lot of HR leaders, I mean, in, in different industries. I mean, I can answer positively that I definitely see a trend where those longer term impacts uh, are more taken into account that companies are no longer paying lip service to social responsibility. Uh, this is something now that is uh, not only dealt with at a local level, but also at their headquarters. And even a lot of boards are asking questions uh, around this. So I, I truly believe that a lot of companies are taking this now extremely seriously and are really balancing the short versus uh, uh, the longer term uh, impacts uh, of uh, the work uh, the work they are doing and the business they are conducting. Yeah, that's great to hear in terms of, you know, what, what I feel passionate about in, in how we achieve the sustainable development goals. It's lovely to hear that you have that view. And also, you know, great for all the HR professionals listening to think about how in their work, in their HR strategies, how important the long term is to knowing that every HR professional is under so much pressure day to day and for, you know, all the short term things that need to be done, you know, immediately. Um, it's, it can be hard. Thank you, Hugo. And our next question, we, we often think about an industry that uh, a CHRO is working in, but, you know, you've worked across so many. So may I just make it really broad for you, perhaps, and ask about what you think is the most exciting opportunity for HR to change the world? Yeah, I mean, of course, changing the world is a very big statement. But having real, real impact for me is that I see in many industries what is needed in terms of talent, in terms of the workforce, is changing very rapidly, rapidly uh, because of digitization, automation, and and so on. Uh, and I, I I do believe uh, that uh, working in this digital world requires other skills, other mindsets than the worlds we are used to in in many industries. And I think the the opportunity uh, that there is, I don't call it upskill or reskill, I, I call it new skill. For me, the opportunity to, to new skill, uh, actually, uh, your direct workforce or your indirect workforce or the communities you work in uh, is extremely important and will change the environment you're working in. And I mean, and many global organizations will therefore have an, a big impact uh, in, uh, in many countries. Otherwise, we risk to have a new literacy gap, I mean, the digital literacy uh, gap. And I think HR leaders uh, can absolutely um, help to ensure that we don't, uh, uh, we, we are not confronted very deeply in some countries with this gap. That's a really interesting point, Hugo, because uh, from Babies Who Love, we think about, well, we're working on reducing the literacy gap uh, in that there are many children in the world that are still uh, growing up illiterate. But you're right, that's almost an outdated way of thinking about literacy, isn't it? For, for their, you know, thinking of when those children grow up and they're adults and the skills that will enable them to, you know, live independent, thriving, happy lives. It's not just reading and writing anymore. So that's food for thought for me too. So thank you for that. And Hugo, is there, um, just to discuss anything that you're personally passionate about now, is there an area of social or environmental injustice that you really care about and have in your career across your HR roles within that work in HR um, had the opportunity to create change for that particular uh, passion that you have? There, is, there are many things I'm passionate about. I mean, I could give many examples about environmental impact and so on. Um, however, I mean, if I need to pick one uh, element, uh, for me, my, 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 my real passion where I can really put my, my, my emotions behind is that I see many parts of the world 
uh, still some basic things are missing, uh, like access to education and healthcare. Uh, and I've always been passionate about uh, about training, about development, uh, to use old school word, uh, <laughs> words. Uh, and indeed, I started my my HR career uh, in training in in a Belgian bank. Uh, so I go back to to my to to to, to my roots. Uh, I think, uh, Cecilia, that in still big parts of the world, access to those basics, meaning healthcare and education, is uh, still missing, uh, which will not help uh, the social divide uh, that, that, that I see. And I think there is an uh, opportunity for many HR leaders uh, to, to really have an, a sustainable uh, impact in those in those two uh, in, in, in 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 those two areas, and where I would say, I mean, if I would like to see one specific action uh, that HR leaders could take, is uh, and I know it's a little bit of a dream, uh, and because we live in a competitive world, um, but I would like to see that HR leaders of different companies different industries are working together to upskill, reskill, new skill uh, the talent in the communities they touch. Because I believe a lot of companies are doing efforts in development uh, in their own way, but also in an isolated way. I think working together of companies of different industries could create such a bigger impact on the communities they touch on that the return on that investment would not only benefit the communities, but also those companies itself. How HR Leaders Change the World is brought to you by From Babies with Love. And this episode is sponsored by our very own Parental Leave Gift Service. We help solve the challenge of connecting with colleagues across parental leave and in returning to work, contributing to talent retention and so too gender balance strategy. From Babies with Love donates 100% of its profits to orphaned and abandoned children. Your beautiful, sustainably sourced From Babies with Love gifts come with the story of how your company is also helping a less fortunate child, creating meaningful engagement. We transform spend that so often already takes place on flowers or products that don't have the sustainable development goals at their heart. We transform that spend to become a consistent, inclusive and strategic part of your working parents programme. Ask us to tell you more at FromBabiesWithLove.org. Make an impact at a defining moment. Yeah, that's so interesting, Hugo, about that collaborative approach. And thinking back to what you were saying before about the shift towards long-term thinking, and you mentioned there the pressure of being competitive, but to be competitive in the long term, you have to have a pipeline of talent that is literate in the traditional meaning of literate, now digitally literate, as you've described. And, you know, what's the role of a company in ensuring it has all the highly skilled people it wants to, to further its goals? And, you know, does that go all the way to ensuring early years education, for example, which is where we intervene, um, because most companies don't. But I see programs that support the upskilling across broad swathes of communities through apprenticeships and internships, and then programs in schools that might be mentoring or training or, or, or other support. But um, like you say, it's not necessarily systemic across an approach to business um, or done in a collaborative way that creates equality of opportunity for everybody in the world and um, creates the skills that all businesses will need in the future with that long-term perspective. So I think that's brilliant and I think you should instigate that. Now, Hugo, just something else to put into your work workforce portfolio there with all the friends you have in HR and the amazing contacts and people you work with. That could be, um, I, you say it's a dream, but I like dreams and I'm sure you can make your dream come true. <laughs> brilliant. Mm, that would be great. Yeah. And Hugo, we like to, in our next question, talk a little bit specifically about equity and inclusion. 
and how and ask you if you have any examples that you would like to share about how you've used your positions in HR to bring about greater equity and inclusion, uh, but importantly, in ways that have also delivered business goals, uh, you know, really Yes, they have societal impact. Yes, they're great for your people, but they're also commercial and um, getting buy-in across the board. Do you have any examples you could share with us? Yeah, I mean, I, I can share quite a bit of examples, uh, both in the work that uh, my team has done on gender equality, where I believe in, in the mining industry, uh, I mean, a lot of companies have gone a long, long way from almost having no women uh, in operational roles to now having a clear, I mean, a clear target, uh, a very clear strategy uh, to get there. Um, And the same is true, uh, I mean, in terms of the employment of, uh, of, uh, of the local population, not as the main workforce, because that's always relatively easy to do, but really in leadership roles. Uh, and um, the, the one thing I would say is uh, make everything measurable in the sense that people see that the productivity of women is as high as that of men. The productivity of a local leader uh, and the impact of a local leader uh, is as high of an expert or can even be higher uh, because of the role in the communities that they play on top of their, I mean, the role in the workforce. Uh, And I think making that measurable does away with uh, a lot of myths that there are existing. Uh, And I mean, I always come back to this, and my apologies for uh, the down to earth example, that's where miners are good at, down down to earth, uh, is that, Um, female truck drivers had better results than male truck drivers. And I'm not talking about small trucks. I'm talking about 300 ton plus trucks. But it's only till you measure it that you know it. Uh, Until then, until that point of measurement, uh, people are thinking, well, that is never going to happen. That cannot be the case. So, I mean, I'm using that very small example. There are much better examples. I mean, to, to do away with all of that bias, those myths that are, that are existing. And I think HR leaders can help, I mean, to really to uh, bust those myths uh, by making it very tangible and talk in business terms, in productivity, not only in social terms. Yeah, I, it's a great example. Um, I know it is just one, like, just like you say, but it's one that we could all, we, I'm picturing the female truck driver in my mind. So um, may I ask one follow-up question? Because measuring is often something that's very difficult to do to, uh, we end up with proxies or, or, or lose some of the nuance of what it is we're trying to measure um, in trying to create a quantitative measure. So I thought it would be really interesting to ask you, if you have an example of something that was really difficult or seemed really difficult to measure, but you found a way and you were able to do it. I'm not sure I'm going to answer your question directly, um, Cecilia, because, I mean, I'm sure there will be examples. Uh, however, I mean, one of the, the things that, that we, we actually saw uh, is that um, when we looked at why um, women, we had less promotions um, with, with women than, than with men. And the idea was, um, okay, that's because we have less women down in the pyramid, so to speak, if I can old, uh, use old school language, and therefore, uh, we have less, maybe not percentage-wise, but we have less talented women. Yeah. When we looked at all, and, and it's really going into the detail, when we really looked at it, we saw that percentage-wise, there was a much higher percentage of what we called, in our terms, high-potential women than men. 
And yet we saw actually that by measuring it, what went wrong was actually in the whole, the whole process that was leading to promotion. So there was really something wrong in the way we approached it. And by changing the process, that could be addressed. But until you have, until you have those numbers laid out at every element in, in your talent stream or, or your, your employee uh, lifetime, till you have those numbers, until you have seen it, I mean, and I've made that mistake too, you often jump to conclusions that tend to be wrong. Great. So it was it was getting into the detail and I, it sounds like you had a whole suite of measurables in order to understand just one thing to get to the truth of, you know, of the information situation and identify the problems in order to address them. Often the, the root cause of issues that you're dealing with doesn't sit at the, the level below the root cause. It sits three or four levels deeper. Yeah. Uh, and this is where... I mean, I would encourage HR and business leaders, and HR leaders are business leaders. Um, I mean, I, I, would, I would encourage all business leaders to really look at the right level and to, I mean, don't give up on the first answer that, you, that you're getting. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much, Hugo, for elaborating there. It's really helpful because um, we struggle with measurement ourselves and I think lots of people do when many of the things we're trying to measure are, uh, have many layers, if, as you said, and are qualitative in nature. But we, we all want numbers to, to be able to analyse. And finally, Hugo, you, you mentioned a specific um, thing you'd like to see all HR leaders doing earlier in our conversation. But I'd like to ask if there's any final thought or final call to action that you would like to give everybody listening, particularly knowing how busy everyone in HR is, you know, something that they really could action in, in a short to medium term time frame, having talked about long term time frames today, but so that we can, you know, all move forward in progressing the change we want to see in the world. What is one action you would like to see all HR leaders and all HR professionals take to make a positive change? Well, I mean, I already answered that question. So now I need to come up with a, with a second uh, with, 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 with the second answer, I, I, I would say what I would like to leave behind is not an answer to your question, but what I, what I would say now is really the time for HR leaders to, to, I mean, to thrive. Why? Because I mean, if you look at basically uh, the three resources that you have, for instance, in the mining industry, which are your natural resources that are sitting in the ground, you have your financial resources and you have your human resources. I mean, if, if, if you look at where the biggest challenge is today, is really on the human resources side. This is where the shortage is. Uh, this is where the biggest change is coming. There is no shortage of, of, of capital to be invested, not in any industry I know about. But I do know that in many industries, People, I mean, are short for talent and, and looking for that talent more holistically uh, and really looking at the, the development and the, the, the reskilling or the new skilling I've talked about is something that you can put relatively quickly uh, in, uh, into action. Thank you, Hugo. And I feel you said so much about new skilling and I also hopeful that the talent that you that you describe that needs to be focused upon and developed and supported will also be helping us to innovate ways that help us protect the natural resource in the equation that uh, the, the three part equation you just described there for to make all the things that we all want and use and I use I'm, I'm no different um, but to do so in a way that you know re reduces destruction I, I'm hopeful as part of you know achieving the SDGs that the, the new talent you you are talking about will will make that happen too. Cecilia that's exactly what I mean with the word new skill and for me it's not about the technical skills that are needed it's also the new mindset that is needed for those changing times. And the two go, go hand in glove. 
Yeah. And that's a huge thought to leave us on, Hugo. Um, Nothing to go on the to-do list next week, but absolutely inspiring and so important for everybody to think about um, as they plan their people strategies and and how we care for people and planet going forward. So thank you so much, Hugo. We've just rattled through like so many areas of work that you've led throughout your career. And I really um, appreciate your time. And thank you again for joining us on How HR Leaders Change the World. My pleasure. I hope you enjoyed this episode of How HR Leaders Change the World. Thank you for tuning in. If you have a moment to leave a review, a five-star one, please, that would be a huge help to achieving our goal to reach more of your peers so we can all contribute to further and faster positive change. For your copy of the show notes, head to frombabieswithlove.org where you can also join the How HR Leaders Change the World mailing list. And make sure you don't miss out on future episodes and bonus materials. And for harnessing the power of your role to create positive social change, I'm sending you a jumping up in the air virtual high five. See you next time on How HR Leaders Change the World.